Well, good, good morning. Can you hear me OK? I'm wearing this microphone. This is OK. All right. So let me, uh, first of all, it really is a pleasure to be here. And, and there are two distinct pleasures for being here. One, um, my son goes to school here, so I got to drop him off and then just come right over here. That was <laughs> extremely convenient. And this is our church, so this is actually really a nice place to come. Anyone belong to St. George's here? OK, so we have a couple people. Very good. Well, who has an iPhone? Oh my gosh, look at you people. How many of you are starting to dislike your iPhone? <laughs> right. <laughs> right. I know, right? Right. right. Well, look, I, I am here to tell you about an unusual tumor, but it's always in the, co every time I do anything, it's always in the context of Steve Jobs because his story is so remarkable in many ways, but so sad in other ways that um, it's, um, that it's, you know, we try to get out and educate people as much as possible. Let me just turn this up. How's that? Is that better? OK, great. Great, 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 great. great. I'll be singing my way later on. I hope you're OK with that. So, so, the, so the tumors that I want to tell you about are a little bit unusual. right? And, and I use the word unusual because about maybe 10 or 20 years, maybe about 20 years ago, you would have said they were rare. No one ever got these cancers. Until I started to do this, and I, and I, I travel, you know, I obviously live here in Nashville. But I travel around the country and the world a lot, giving lectures and teaching about these t cancers. And everywhere I go, people keep telling me, gosh, there are more and more. And, and patients call me from across the world, and they'll Facebook me, and they'll say, I go. I don't know what's going on. And you know, can you help me? And so, and so what I'm hoping, you know, I'm very pleased to be the very first lecturer of your, of your session. I hope, I hope I don't bore you too much, and you'll come again. But really, what I want to convey to you is how complicated kind of some of these tumors are. You know, we, we think of the usual cancers. There's breast cancer, and there's colon cancer, and there's prostate cancer. And those are very dangerous. I'm very glad that we have, you know, methods for screening them and, you know, making people better. But there are some unusual ones. And we have to be sensitive to it because, you know, these neuroendocrine cancers are unusual. Okay? They're not so, uh, so common as people would think. But it does affect everyday people. And that's really the thing where it becomes um, very important to understand. I don't know why he keeps doing that. I, I, I apologize. But, you know, it affects people, and, you know, mothers, brothers, fathers, friends, you know. And so, God help us, let us hope that none of you ever need my services. But I would not be surprised if someone in this room either knows someone right now with this particular disease, or at some point will meet someone or know someone who has this disease. And that's really the thing. And it might be rare, but it doesn't have to end your life. And that's always the message I want to give people, is that there's hope. There's a lot of hope. Now, the reason that there's a little zebra running in the corner is that it's our, kind of our motto for kind of unusual diseases, especially for neuroendocrine diseases. And what it is is when someone has a cough, when someone has stomach pain, you're supposed to think about horses. This is what you're taught in medical school. Well, if you hear hooves, you're supposed to think horses, right? don't automatically think a zebra unless there happens to be a zebra running across the yard, right? And that's exactly what the situation is. Okay, so, so here are some important people who have it, had it well. You know, this is Dave Thomas, right? Because you all love your Wendy's cheeseburgers, right? right. So he actually uh, did very, very well. He, he's a good story. He actually didn't die of carcinoid neuroendocrine cancer. He died with his carcinoid cancer. Do you know what he died of? Heart attack. You think I'm kidding. The man loved his work. Loved his work. And, okay, and, and so who's this? Audrey. Right, Audrey Hepburn. Right, Audrey Hepburn for many, many years. I mean, you know, she, as she got on in her days, she was always very, very slender. But she said her stomach hurt all the time. And, and no one, they just kind of poo-pooed it. And they said, well, you know, it is, it is what you have. You're very busy. You're stressed out. Until they did an operation in her and they found there was cancer spread all over her belly. Yeah, she died with that. And then, of course, this is Steve Jobs. And Steve Jobs, as you might have all noticed, anyone read his book? OK, so you get a sense of it. The problem with Steve Jobs was, you know, you know we, are, we are in a, a place of worship where we worship God and Jesus. I think pretty much at Apple, everyone worshiped him. And so he really felt like he was invincible, right? So when, and I know his oncologist in, in, in Stanford. And, and he told me, oh, I tell you, Steve Jobs was difficult. They wouldn't let him drink blood. He wouldn't let him put IVs. He wouldn't do tests. They wouldn't do surgery. He wouldn't do anything. 
until about a year later, when he, he for the first year he tried to do a kind of model of naturopathic type of things, which is you know not you know an unreasonable thing to do, except when we know already what to do for these things. You know we can actually take care of these things, and um, and it was a problem, it was a problem, and he became metastatic, and you you can see him when he's on stage, his body started to get thinner and thinner and thinner over the years, and that's basically was his disease started to get worse and worse. And it's, it's amazing that he lived seven or eight years at all because, you know, he was ignoring these things. But that's what, that's what happened. So I'll tell you more about it. So, so here's the patient experience, okay? You have to understand. And this is, this is always what we have to consider, right? So here, I, I have cancer. My gosh, you know, I came in because my stomach hurt. And then they say, I have what kind of cancer? Right? And this is really where it becomes complicated because the patient's never heard. You know, if you have breast cancer or prostate cancer, you kind of understand that, right? There's a ribbon for it and there's a race for it and, and people are well trained for these types of things, right? I mean, you know what I'm saying. <laughs> but when you have, when someone says, well, you actually have neuroendocrine cancer, you're like, I have what? Right? And, then, and then the doctor says, well, I, you know, I don't know anything about this cancer, right? That's very distressing. Very, very distressing. <clears throat> you say, excuse me, you don't know anything about this cancer? What are, you, what are you talking about? Well, what do I do? And that doctor says, well, let me go look it up. Right? That's not very reassuring either. And then where do I go? Right? And, that's, and then you feel really, really lost. I mean, if you thought that Obamacare website was hard to manage, I mean, <laughs> when you have a cancer your doctor doesn't know anything about, you really don't know how to manage it. So where do I go? And so this is, so after the diagnosis, this is usually what happens. They say, people will say to you, they'll say, you know, anyone who has cancer will say, gosh, you look so good, you can't have cancer. Right, you can't have cancer. Then they'll say, then they'll say, oh, carcinoid, which is another n name for this kind of cancer. Oh, carcinoid isn't really cancer, it's benign, right? So I've had many patients come from all over the country, and I'll, and I'll show you a map later. And they'll say, I went to the emergency room, I told them I had carcinoid cancer, and they said, so? Yeah, it was awful. It was awful. It was awful. So then, you'll say, well, Steve Jobs told me it was a nutritional problem. Right? You remember that? About seven or eight years ago, he said, oh, I have a, a nutritional problem. It's no problem. I don't have cancer. And luckily, his stock didn't go down. But that's why he did it. Right? And then I've never had a patient with this disease. The doctors will say it all the time. And then we can just watch it. And you watch it because you don't know what to do with it. Right? That's what the doctor does when they watch it. Okay? So that's a real problem. And, so, and then the, the husband or, or the wife will say, well, why are you in the bathroom all the time? Okay. And that really gets to the point of quality of life. And you'll see in a second what that means. And why can't you leave your house? Because you're tied to the bathroom. No one wants to talk about it. No one wants to admit it. But it's a huge, huge, huge effect on one's quality of life. And you can't leave. So, so here are some of the symptoms of the, of the tumors we have, okay? Sometimes they're, they're totally asymptomatic. You randomly find it on a CAT scan or a CT or something like that, or an X-ray or something. And then you have these things. Anyone ever have diarrhea before? You don't have to raise your hands. <laughs> I will just trust from your laughter that someone has, in this room has had diarrhea. Anyone ever have blood sugar problems? Anyone have a rash before? Anyone have a rash that the dermatologist wasn't quite sure what to do with? Right? Anyone had abdominal pain or a blockage? I'm sure someone in this room has had surgery for the blockage before. Anyone had anger before? <laughs> gallstones. Anyone had gallstones? Anyone had ulcers? Okay, so th the point of it is that in de indeed these are symptoms that everybody has, right? And everyone can have it for years and years and years and years and years. And then when, the, when finally it's like, well, you know, something's a little unusual, and then your doctor gets that CAT scan and your body's full of cancer, that is a very distressing feeling. Because it's been going on for a while, right? So here, these are things that happen all the time. Anyone flush? Anyone flush? I flush all the time, right? You know, yeah, I you know, walk in the room, there's a beautiful woman in the room, and I'm like, oh my god, I'm <laughs> nervous. But in fact, it's a, these are all very common things, and that's where it becomes scary, okay? So let me tell you a little bit about these things and why it's so unusual. And, but, but it all makes sense when we're done. So, so what is a neuroendocrine cancer? Well, neuroendocrine cancers are unusual cancers in general of the intestines, the pancreas, and the lung. Okay. So 
you know, it's, it's, it, we all take breathing and eating for granted, right? It works really, really well until it doesn't work, okay? So when you're chronically wheezing, you know, you certainly could have asthma, and that would be the kind of the horse version of it. Or you can have bronchial carcinoid, which would be the zebra version of it, okay? You can have diarrhea, which is certainly be from, you know, that gas station sushi you had yesterday. Yeah, that can certainly be. <laughs> That was a delayed laugh. What took you so long, my friend? <laughs> um, or you could have a carcinoid cancer of your small intestine. Okay? And really the point of it is that you have these little cells that are part of what's called the diffuse endocrine system. Right? And we think about the endocrine system as being kind of from your pituitary, your thyroid, your adrenal, kind of very classic organs. But in fact, the largest producer of this hormone called serotonin, so you, you, serotonin you've heard before, right? It's, a, it's the happy hormone, you know, you take serotonin, Prozac, right, works on serotonin. And everyone thinks that serotonin is produced by the brain. Well, it is, certainly, but actually the number one producer of serotonin in your body is actually your gut. So when you have a gut feeling, there's a lot of biochemistry going on behind it, so you should really consider it. But those cells produce those things, and they help to regulate your food and your digestion, and they make sure you don't have diabetes. So it's very, very powerful, but it's quiet. You don't know anything about it, which is just the way it is, right? And they make a lot of hormones. But every now and then, they turn into tumors. Okay? Lucky for us, they, in general, tend to be slow-growing tumors, so there's usually no huge rush in doing things. But that's, but that's something that a, a specialist needs to help figure out. It can affect all ages, you know. Um, we just had a very, my, uh, I trained in Sweden, I'll show you a couple of pictures in a second, and my professor from Sweden came last week, and we saw two children. So we saw a 14-year-old and we saw a 16-year-old with this kind of cancer, right? And it's difficult to diagnose and there's a lack of awareness. So there's a reason why I'm here in front of you today. There's a reason why I just, I just got off a plane last night from Charleston, giving lectures and things, and I travel all around because it's, I kind of feel like it's my crusade to get out there and help people. Uh, because if you don't know about it, there is no question there's a fair chance you will die of it. Okay? Whereas if you know of it and we can take care of you, you can live a long, good, healthy life. So here's what, here are some numbers. I won't show you too many graphs. I'll show you mostly pictures to kind of illustrate what we're doing. But just to give you a feeling that there's something about it that's going up, right? So these are all the various kinds of neuroendocrine tumors. And it's not you know, you can see they come from various organs, and most of them are relatively stable. The pancreas, the, the uh, uh, col sorry, I don't know why he keeps doing that. I apologize. I, anyone? Oh, it's okay. The colon. But there are two that are going way, way, way up. One is the rectum, and that actually I think is mostly from all the colonoscopies we're doing, which is great. I'm very pleased about that. But look, the small intestine is going up, and the lung is going up, right? And this is really what my practice is like. People just pour in from all over the country with these um, unusual tumors, and they come mostly from the small intestine and the lung. And the problem is, those are places that are hard to find. Yes, sir? Why isn't uh, liver cancer part of the neuroendocrine uh, umbrella? Well, it is part of it. So liver cancer, so the question was, why is liver cancer not part of the neuroendocrine umbrella? There are very few actually true neuroendocrine cells within the liver. The liver is a very specialized organ. But the one place that the neuroendocrine cells all like to meet up is in the liver. So a lot of my therapy that I, I, I do is directed towards the liver. So but liver, the liver itself it can be very complicated. It can have different types of cancer. It can have a, what we call hepatocellular carcinoma, which is a, a, a direct tumor of the liver. There are what are called cholangiocarcinomas. There are colon cancers that spread there. So the liver is a very popular place for tumors to go. But it is, it is something that we consider very, very deeply. So you can see it's going up. Now the thing about it, you would say, gosh, well, this is an unusual tumor. Dr. Liu is, you know, how does he make a, a, a career of this? Well, the truth of the matter is there are actually many more patients with this than you think, right? So this is liver cancer, as the gentleman asked. Here's esophagus cancer, pancreas cancer, and stomach cancer. And these are the... I'm sorry, I apologize. I don't know why that's happening. These are, the number, these are the people walking around with this cancer, right? And the reason they're so few, relatively, is because they die. They only live for two or three years. So that's the problem, okay? But if you look at this quote-unquote rare cancer, look how many people are just walking around with this disease. And I'll bet it's twice as much, actually, than the, most of the people don't even know about it. And it's really because we can take care of these people so well that, in fact, they do well and they can live well and, you know, they can continue to pay taxes. And that's the most important thing about all of this medical care. <laughs> and that's the goal, right? But it's, it's very, very underappreciated. 
So, and this is really what we're all about at, at Vanderbilt, right? We're really about quality of life. It's always the first thing. And we're about creating a home because when you, when you are diagnosed with something and your doctor has no idea what's going on and you're the one who's doing all the homework to figure out what's, what's happening, it's nice to know that there's some person, some team that is very experienced in this and can really help you. And so that's what we try to do at Vanderbilt. And quality of life, of course, is so very important. And really it's about hope, having community, and a real understanding. And this is part of what you guys are doing today. Okay? So let me just, a little overview, I'll tell you, I told you a little bit about neuroendocrine. I'll tell you a little about diagnostics, because that's very important. So how, what do the tests mean? I can tell you what we can do about it, because there's a lot to do. And what's really new at Vanderbilt, and why, you know, why our, our team is so special. Okay? So a little bit more. So here are some of the hormones and cells that are produced. So they come from the lung, they can come from the digestive tract, and they can secrete a bunch of different hormones, which is why they can cause so many um, different kind of syndromes. Insulin, for example, will make you, everyone knows what insulin does, right? Insulin controls blood sugar, right? And so diabetics take it because they don't make insulin. Well, these tumors make too much, and it can actually be a very deadly disease because if your blood sugar drops to 25, right, it should be between 70 and 90 or 100. If it drops to 25 and you're driving along, you know what will happen? You'll do this, you'll pass out, right? And if you don't feel it, you'll do this. So it can be a very deadly disease, right? Glucagon, for example, is very unusual because it gives people a bad rash. So some people will have a bad rash. The dermatologist will chase it with steroids and things, and they can never make it go away. And in fact, it's caused by cancer. So it's not so simple. And the, the great thing about it is that these tumors almost universally express something called a somatostatin receptor. You don't have to remember that term. You just have to know that there's a target. There's a, there's a, uh, um, a keypad, a key lock that's on these tumors that we use. Okay? And it's been a real struggle because these were first described probably around 1907 by this German uh, pathologist. And he initially called it, he said, well, you know, they look like cancer, okay, but I don't think they're cancer. So he called it a carzenoid, which is cancer-like. Okay? And about seven years later, he collected a whole bunch more patients. He said, oh my god, I made a terrible mistake. This is a cancer that kills people. What he was saying is this isn't the usual kind of colon, prostate, breast cancer we see. This is something unusual. Unfortunately, his terminology has lasted for the last 110 years. And because of it, a lot of people today, today, you can go to Centennial, I mean, I heard this, and they'll say, that's not a cancer. It is very much a cancer, and it's because of misconceptions, okay? It's been called other things before, and this is the problem. It's been called apodomas, it's been called islet cell tumors, and finally we've kind of come down to the term neuroendocrine cancer. That's really the word we use, okay? So again, they, and sometimes we use the word carcinoid, okay? And carcinoid is, is the term when it comes from the lungs and the, and the intestine, the digestive tract. So there's a little bit of a terminology that makes it complicated, but I'm, I'm pretty much going to use these two terms interchangeably. Just think of neuroendocrine tumors being kind of the umbrella term, and so that can come from your pancreas or from your gut, and carcinoid is kind of the subclass that comes from your gut and your lungs. Does that make sense? Okay, so keep that in mind. Okay, so this is what happens, okay? This is what happens normally. These hormones, the somatostatin, will bind to its receptor, Okay? And it will control the secretion of hormones. You can see these hormones kind of popping out of the cell membrane. Okay. That's what happens, and it should be, it's very tightly regulated, and it's very wonderful. It's, it's almost magical. It's magical. Um, but sometimes it doesn't work so well. Okay? The, good, the good thing for us is that these tumors have these little targets on here, so we take great advantage of these things being here. This is a molecule. It's called somatostatin. It's a hormone. For those of you who are Latin fans, I know you guys are into learning. So somato means body, and uh, statin means stop, right? So this is the hormone that makes everything in your body stop. And people say, well, you know, why, why do I have this hormone? And I say, well, God was very smart. He said that, you know, it would be a bad to have diarrhea if you're being chased by a tiger, right? <laughs> so he said, you, you know, if you get all excited and you're being chased by a tiger, you should probably turn off all your gut function and just run, okay? So that's... So that's, that's kind of why it exists, okay? And we've taken good advantage of that. So, so that's kind of an idea. You get the sense of what it is and what that tumor is, right? So let me tell you a little bit about how we work it up. So one of the important things we do is we measure hormones, okay? So we, we are very fortunate. There are many um, uh, cancers in which you can't really measure things. But in, for us, the hormone itself makes a big deal, and it helps us, helps us um, figure out what type of cancer you have and how to treat it and how well we're treating it, right? So for example, if, if, you have a, if you have a very astute doctor 
and he notices that you're flushing and you have diarrhea, he may say, oh, well, you know, this has been going on longer than it should be. Maybe you have carcinoid, and let's check some of these markers. So they can check something called a 5-H-I-A-A. Don't, remember, don't bother remembering. Just know that we have these tools available. Because that's a hormone that, that, that's a breakdown product of that serotonin hormone I told you about, which causes all these problems. We can measure gastrin. Gastrin actually is an unusual tumor, to, uh, unusual hormone, and what it does is it gives you ulcers, really bad ulcers that never, ever go away, right? So that's really the problem, something called Zollinger-Ellison syndrome. Insulin I mentioned to you about, glucagon I mentioned to you about, VIP, vasoactive intestinal peptide, you get diarrhea, right? But this is not kids' diarrhea. This is where you get diarrhea, like 25 times a day diarrhea, and you're hospitalized. We, before we had all these therapies, my old friends, they'd say, oh my gosh, we, we keep them in the hospital, they couldn't get out of bed, they were having diarrhea constantly. Oh, it was awful, 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 awful. So these are not so simple things. We take it for granted now, but they're not so simple. So one of the things we like to do is we like to take pictures, okay? And pictures are very, very, very important, these things. And, and I'm, I'm sure everyone in this room has had some kind of CT or MR or ultrasound or something, so you, you, can, you know how important it is. And so, so we can get things like CT scans, right? And this is a lady who had some back pain, and she's a lady I take care of, and they didn't know what it was, so they got this CAT scan, and it turned out she had a big tumor in her pancreas here. I don't know if you can appreciate that, but this is the, her normal pancreas, and this kind of rim here is a tumor, okay? Keep that picture in mind, because I'll show you what it looks like when I took it out. Okay. Here's another gentleman, too. Here's a very, he has a very interesting story. He, uh, he had, was on, he lives in Kentucky, he was, it was driving to, on vacation or something, and his stomach hurt really badly, so he went to the hospital, and just the local hospital, he didn't know anything, did they stop by, and so they said, you need surgery right away. So they took him to surgery, and they took out his intestines. And then a couple days later, they said, you know, we think we, you have a rare cancer, we think we need to take you back to the operating room. He said, absolutely not. <laughs> so he got on the internet, found us, came to us, and in fact, we took out this tumor. You see that tumor right there? and these blood vessels that run along it. And so the standard operation um, would have been to take all of this. And if you take all of these blood vessels, you have to take all of the small intestines. So he would, have, he would have had very, very short small intestine. But since he came to see us, and we were very you know, lucky to take care of him, we were able to remove that and preserve all of his intestine. Right? So there is a difference between, um, and everyone will tell you, there's a difference between someone who sees this every day and does it over and over again, versus someone who only sees it maybe once every two or three years, or maybe their whole career. So, but you can see these scans are very helpful, okay? But sometimes you don't like what you see, okay? So here are three CT scans, okay? And here are three patients, okay? And you can, I will, so the gentleman asked about the liver. So this is the liver. You can see it's kind of this round, triangular, almost shaped organ. You see, it's supposed to be smooth gray like this. You see all these balls inside there? Those are all tumors, okay? So, sh so this one has a tumor, this one has tumors, this one has tumors. So the question is, which liver would you want to have? Right, the answer is no, you don't want any of these, right? And, but you're like, I mean, how can, how can anyone have a 30, how can a 32-year-old have disease like this? Well, in fact, she's the one who had the worst of them all. The worst of them all. So it just goes to show you that it is blind of age, it is blind of gender, it is blind of intelligence, it is blind of education, it is what it is. And sometimes you have to be very, very careful about it, too, because this is what's called an MRI of your liver, okay? And this is not routinely performed, but it's, very import it's a very important test for me. So, for example, this gentleman is from Alabama, and he had a very astute oncologist. And the oncologist checked his blood, remember, like I told you. So he had this cancer. It was, it was removed, and, and the surgeon told him, you're cured. Told him, you're cured. But the oncologist said, ah, you know, that, that, you know, that's not quite true. So he kept following him, and he checked his blood, and his blood kept going up and up and up. And he said, well, how can this be? So he repeated his CAT scan. His CAT scan was totally negative, head to toe, nothing, right? Then he said, you know, I don't believe this. This is a smart doctor, and he said, I don't believe this. So he got something called an MRI, and in fact, there was a tumor sitting right here. And it's only because he got the right test that he knew what was going on. If he got the wrong test, and I get this all the time, I get patients who fly from Houston. So there's a very large cancer center in Houston called the MD Anderson Cancer Center. It's a fine, fine institution. Don't get me wrong. It's an amazing institution. But the problem is they don't, they don't, they don't deal with this kind of like, like, like we do. And um, so the patient went down to MD Anderson. She's from Idaho. 
and she got this work up and they got a recommendation and then she came to me and I said well you need some more tests and so I got this particular test and I found like 25 more tumors in her and she said gosh I went to MD Anderson and I said well you know you still have to know what you're doing doesn't matter what the name is behind you right you still have to know what you're doing but anyway anyway it just gives you an idea so it's very important so let me let me let me give you a, a sense of what imaging should be like ideally I hope you can I hope you can hear this because it's so I'm, I'm sorry I don't know what that happens Let's try this again. Can you hear it? Oh, here you go. Let me start. Let me start over. Let me start over. Hold on. I love this video. It dates me, I think. Look what she does. She puts that cigarette right. <laughs> I, I love that video because that is the best form of in, imaging you could possibly have, right? You know, you just stand there, you just look, it's free, it's in color. I mean, gosh, that's pretty good. Those are all really good things. So if anyone comes to my clinic, you should know I do wear red and blue tights. <laughs> so don't be shocked. Don't be shocked. But, here, but here's what, it, what Superman saw. Right? So you can see her lungs are pink, which is, which is probably not accurate. And just by living in New York City, it's not going to be accurate. <laughs> or, or Metropolis, wherever she lives. And, uh, but it's free, it's quick, it's in color. You can see it, you get a lot of information from it. But the resolutions are actually really pretty terrible. So I say this is, you know, this is Kryptonian technology. It's much better here in Nashville. Much better here. Um, so and we have lots of different kinds of tests. And some of them are very good and some of them are not so good. And I'll bet some of the people in this room have had something called a PET scan, right, a PET scan. And a PET scan, which is really wonderful, is terrible for our type of cancer, and just for various biologic reasons. It is what it is. But if you don't know that and you order these things, you think, oh, you're scot-free and clear. Yes, sir? What is a PET scan? PET stands for something called positron emission tomography. So if you have an, so everyone has had an X-ray, right? An X-ray is just a square picture, right, just a flat picture. People in here have had a CT scan before. A CT scan is kind of almost like a three-dimensional type of picture. Well, the PET scan puts color on top of the black and white picture. Essentially, it's what it is. And what it is, it looks for tumors. That's really the purpose of it, it looks for tumors. So, so that's what a PET scan is. And, and it's very, very often used for cancer. And it's very often used, and it works really quite well if you know how to use it. But it's like everything, it's a tool. Um, and if you don't know how to use a tool right, you'll, you'll use it wrong. You'll use it wrong. So, so here's uh, something called nuclear imaging that we do. So I showed you at black and white pictures. So here's some nuclear imaging. And this is kind of what it is. Okay? So I'm able to scan people's whole bodies from the tip of their head to the bottom of their feet looking for tumors. Okay? And this is one type of test. Here's this FDG, um, the kind of relatively frequently used PET scan that we use. And then we have some other special ones, and they can pick up things in very odd places. So here's a tumor from um, one of my patients. She had a tumor in her left breast, and they thought it was breast cancer, and it turned out to be the carcinoid neuroendocrine cancer. And it's only because she had the right test that we could find it. But here's what the test kind of looks like, and it, is, it, it literally looks like this. So you get a big picture, and you kind of see these little fuzzy images here, and you hope that's it, and then... They empty their bladder and they come back the next day and they, they, you look again, and, but that's really it. And they tell me to operate on this picture, right? And that's not so easy because it's, I don't have quite the resolution I wish I did. Okay, so now, but that's the state of the art. And this is literally the picture I get. So, you know, sometimes you see a doctor, you bring a disc with you, right? And they'll bring the pictures and look at the pictures. Well, some doctors just look at the report, but I always look at the pictures too. And I'll get this picture from someone who came from Indiana, let's say. And they'll say, okay, I want you to operate on this. And they're literally this small. And I just like, I mean, I don't, I can't tell what's going on. You think in this modern day of technology, we could transfer these images. You can't. They still come as little JPEG little pictures. So it's hard to work with. And it's, it, my friend, Ronald Walker, he's a, he's a nuclear medicine specialist at our hospital. He says, well, you know, it's good, but it's kind of like looking at the sun behind the clouds. You know they're there. You just can't quite make out exactly what it is. And so that's kind of the, the 20th century technology we've been dealing with. Right? And that's actually what, if you were to not come to Vanderbilt, for example, that's pretty much technology you'd end up with almost every place else in the United States. Okay? And I'll show you why it's grossly, grossly inadequate and why we're working so hard. So now what do you do? Okay, so now you have this unusual cancer, 
and you know you just heard Steve Jobs and you know he died of it and you know it's awful and and you say well you should go see someone who knows what they're doing right so you come see someone who's, who's an expert and they say well this is what you should do you should cut it out okay right because Steve Jobs didn't let them cut it out right so the first thing you should do is you should cut it out right the second thing you should do is you should let them cut it out right and the third thing you should let them do you should let them Cut it out. That's right. See, you know, they, 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 they learn so well. This is so great. What a great group. <laughs> you should cut this thing out because it causes a bunch of problems, right? So this is when I trained in Europe. This is a, a dear friend of mine. His name is Dr. Per Hellman. And he said, if you could cut the tumor out, you could almost double these people's life expectancy, okay? And really the problem was if they had liver disease, it was going to be a, really a problem. But even when you had liver disease, if you could still take that tumor out from their intestine, it still made them live longer, okay? And these are things that... You know, most doctors will say, no, absolutely not. You have it spread out elsewhere. You should never have that thing cut out. And it's just not true. So this is why it becomes so complicated, okay? So, and this is what happens. You kind of get this little tumor right here. It's hard to appreciate, but there's a tiny little tumor right here. And then it gets bigger and it spreads to the, the lymph nodes that are right around it. And then it really cli climbs up I-40 and gets all the way to the liver. That's essentially what it does. And these tiny little tumors, less than two centimeters, can be very aggressive and angry and metastasized. So they can spread. So it is a totally different paradigm that we think of. Normally we think of kind of big tumors spreading elsewhere. In this case, these little tumors can spread in a big, big way. So, you know, you have to understand, that's why it's so important to see someone who thinks about it all the time, because they understand the difference in the concept. And now you all understand, too, okay? And let me show you. Here are some pictures. So, so I do do a lot of liver surgery, and we do it very safely now, because we have lots of tools and, and tricks and, and toys that let me do the, the, the liver surgery very safely. So these are some of the things that I use, and I'll show you why it's so important. So, and here's another kind of technology I like to use. It, allows, it lets me kind of generate three-dimensional images of the liver. So I can measure how much tumor you have, I can find it, I can plan my operation, those fancy little things. So those are, those are good, those are good tools. But ultimately, it's, it's what you really want is you want someone who has a, a, a smart brain, because this is just technique, okay? So if anyone's going to puke, you can leave now, because I'm going to show you a bunch of yucky and grossy, gross and squishy things, okay? So, so here... So here's the first tumor, okay? That's it. This is, these, are, these are my hands here. This is the small intestine, okay? And that's the tumor. I will bet that tumor has been there for 10 to 15 years, if not 30, if not 30. So you can appreciate that if you are in a small hospital in um, Cumberland, Maryland, or wherever, and someone comes through, you could easily walk right past that and just not even see it as a surgeon, as a surgeon, not even see it, okay? Now, you want to make it even harder? How about that one? See it? Yeah, you can't even see it. You can't even see it. And the only reason is because I, you know, when I do this operation, I feel so very carefully. I mean, I've gotten used to it. So I feel very carefully. I say, oh, here it is. You can find it. Here's another one. Here's another. So my, one of my partners, who is older than I am, far, far um, senior to me, she had this operation. She performed this operation. And, and she said she couldn't find it. So I went in to, to help her. I said, oh, here it is. So it just goes to show you that even when you are kind of looking for it, it can be hard to find. So it really just takes a lot of effort. And that's it, right there. So we open this up in the back table, and you can see here, that's all the tumors. And it probably is 15 to 20 years old. Yeah, it's strange, isn't it? 15 to 20 years old. Right, right. So older than some of you in the room, I'm sure. <laughs> but that little, that little bugger, right, can turn to this, right? Here's a tumor in the, what we call the mesentery. And this can cause a real problem because it can scar down all your intestines. And if your intestines are scarred, they won't move. And if you can't move your food, guess what? You get bloated and you vomit. It's awful. Okay? So, and it can do, a, you know, it, can, it does it almost all the time. Okay, all the time. And here's one, right? And so if you don't get used to it, you don't recognize this too. Here's one where he said, oh, well, he has a car carcinoma right here. See it? But then if you look hard, in fact, there's one, two, three, four... Five of them, five of them. So I had to remove all those from the man. And he's, he's feeling really quite well. He's doing very, very well. Here's another one here. You can see it here. So it's, you just have to look hard to find them and really know what you're looking for, OK? Um, so here's some more pictures, just to gross you out. 
And some that can be very, very small. Look, that's just a tiny, tiny little lymph node. It's only five millimeters. It took me forever to find that thing. But I knew where it was because of, of the workup that the patient had. So I got it out. Okay. Remember that lady who had that pancreas one where she had that back pain with that thing? So here's her tumor. Here it is, right? So this is the pancreas. So I took out the end of her pancreas. And here's the tumor just hanging right off of it. So it just goes to show you that these things can be relatively quiet for a long time until they bother you. And if you're lucky if it bothers you early. If you're unlucky, it bothers you very, very, very late. And you don't know about it until much later on. So here's another one. You can see here, this is a pancreas, and this is a tumor inside. It kind of has this kind of soft, waxy kind of color to it. And uh, you, just have to, you just have to know what you're doing. Right. Here's one from a lung. This is a young woman. She's an interesting tumor. She's a young woman. She's from Utah. And she called me because she had gone to her university hospital in Salt Lake, which is a, a big, famous hospital. And they said, she's 42, she has young children. They said, we can't do anything for you. you should, they really said this, you should go home, take your pain pills, and just see what happens. Right? So this is, at a, this is at her state's university hospital. So she finds me, she calls me, and I say, why? Why would they tell you such a thing? So we flew her down here, and she had no insurance. Right, so Vanderbilt did this, you know, because they are a great institution. So she came down. We took care of her. We 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 worked her up. We did all the tests. We took her to surgery, and she feels better than she's felt in like six years. So it just goes to show you that there is hope when the person taking care of you knows what they're doing. So here's her tumor. And it's right there. Okay, and she had a very lovely operation. Yes, ma'am. How did she know it was all you? Like she looked. Yeah, she knew it was a neuroendocrine cancer, and, she, she, and they, they didn't send her. She hunted for us on the internet. Right? And I'll, I'll tell you another story. Oh but, oh, but let me tell you, this is not uncommon. This is not uncommon. So let me... Uh, uh, go ahead. Yes, ma'am. That's an interesting question. I can't tell you that. That's actually a much deeper question than you think. In fact, if anyone follows the news recently, they've been talking about, well, what's a real breast cancer and what's not a real breast cancer? That's a very deep question. The problem with a lot of these tumors is they cause problems because they secrete hormones. So they cause, they cause people problems. So we take them out anyway. That's why we do that. Um, but it certainly could be, it would not surprise, well, they can't all be, I know for sure, because they've done autopsy studies in which people who have had no cancer died of their heart attack or whatever, and you go and you find these things, and they're actually about 10 times as prevalent as we think they are. So they're actually, so people do die with it rather than of it. So your answer is, for, your, your question is very good. Um, but the, the, the story I want to tell you is that it's, it's not so easy to diagnose, and I don't, you know, I don't begrudge anyone who, gives, who doesn't really understand it. So when I had just arrived back from Sweden, um, and I'll tell you the story a little bit later, um, I uh, was at home in the middle of the day. I was really tired, and so I turn on, because I can't watch TV in the middle of the day, right? You know, I'm you know, here with you guys. <laughs> and so I turn on the TV, and w what other, like, it's like the most in, in, important medical information show on television, the Dr. Oz show, right? <laughs> so the Dr. Oz show is on, right? And so he says, eat your sweet potatoes and your blueberries, or whatever he tells me. <laughs> and so he, he, does this, he does this show. The title is called Am I Normal, right? Am I Normal? I'm like, well, that's a loaded question. <laughs> so, and so he goes to the audience, and he, you know, he goes to a, a young woman, and he says, you know, tell me what your problem is. She says, oh, I have blah, blah, blah. And she says, oh, yeah, that's okay. You should do this. And he goes to a young man, right, who couldn't be but my age, you know, 30-something years old, and he says, what's your problem? And he says, well, I um, have hot flashes. And he's young. And, I, and he says, and he tells a little bit of stuff, and he says, oh, you know, don't worry, hot flashes are very common, it's no problem. You know, men get hot flashes just like women do. They have, you know, hormonal issues. And I was like... I don't remember having hot flashes. <laughs> I mean, you know, I'm, I'm the same age as that guy. I don't, I don't think I'm going through menopause. <laughs> so, so I write to Dr. Oz. So I know Dr. Oz personally, actually, because he and I work together at Columbia. And I write to him and say, oh, you know, Mehmet, your show is great. <laughs> when you need a young Asian correspondent, call me. <laughs> But then I said, I saw your show, it was called Am I Normal, and you interviewed a young man, he said he flushes. I said, you know, I gotta tell you, my friend, it is not actually that common for young men to flush and to, to have hot flashes. I think you better find out that he doesn't have metastatic carcinoid. So he wrote back to me, Eric, oh, I'm glad you're doing well, blah, blah, blah. He says, I'll check. He's not gotten back to me. 
but I will bet that young man might have cancer. Because I hear the story, oh, I hear it every day, right? I hear it every day, so it's, that's what it is. So it's not, and he's a smart guy, he's a great doctor, don't get me wrong, he really is, he really is as nice as he appears on TV, he really is, yeah. And very gracious. Uh, and it's not fair, because he's like tall and handsome and smart, ah, oh, it's awful. So, <laughs> so jealous, so jealous. But anyway, so, so, so besides surgery, we do have hormonal therapy, right? So it's not like, it's not unlike our, um, uh, breast cancers, right, where, where women are, have their cancers removed and they're treated with hormone therapy for five years. So we, we have kind of that type of thing too. And we treat them with something called somatostatin analog. So remember that hormone I told you about at the very beginning that it made spin around, that's natural to you? Well, we have that as a synthetic version. It's actually won multiple Nobel Prizes. And it has truly, truly revolutionized our field. There, you know, you'll hear about this. There will be some like $30,000 drug that you'll get and it, it improves your survival for like three days. I mean, you've heard this story before, right? And that's what, but this drug, when it first came out, it got that person who was having diarrhea and couldn't leave the hospital out of the hospital. It made people who had um, bad heart disease, it got rid of that. It made people who had diarrhea 12 times a day, couldn't leave their house, down to three or four, which is, you know, relatively manageable and they could free themselves. So I always say, I say this is as close to a miracle drug as possible. And it has made that company $26 billion. So that's a miracle in itself. So it is, it is a very, but I say, look, you know, they deserve every penny of it because it has totally, totally changed people's lives. That is, that is money well spent. Okay. We have other drugs too, something called interferon. It's a hormone that we use as well too. There are chemotherapeutic drugs. You know, if, if God help us, anyone here has had, chem has had cancer and chemo before, you know it's not so easy, right? These are poisons. These are poisons. But sometimes they work. But in our cancers, they only work in very selective cases. So this is where, if you go see kind of a regular community oncologist, they may think, well, I know how to give chemo, so I'm going to give you chemo. And this, so, so let me tell you the story. So a young woman came to us last week. She was 17 years old. And she had this cancer in her lungs. And she saw our professor. And she, and she brought a letter from this place called Cornell University. You may have heard of it. It's a very powerful, very prestigious, wonderful hospital, right? It is a wonderful hospital. Let me explain. But their adult oncologist wanted to give her heavy-duty chemo, the whole kind of shebang. And uh, so he came to us, and he says that, was, that would have been wrong. So she was smart. Her mother was very smart. Obviously, you know, your, your daughter has cancer. You're going you're gonna to chase the best doctor in the world, right? And he happened to be here in the States that week. So they came down, and they said, that would have been wrong, but we're going to treat you with this medicine, this medicine, this medicine. And her, her quality of life will be much, much better. So it just goes to show you that it's, you have to just be careful about these things. One thing that we do do is, is we treat the liver a lot. And this sounds very kind of high-tech, and it really is, but what you can do is you can actually put catheters into your liver, and you can shoot it with poisons, you can shoot it with radioactivity, you can shoot it even just with ways of blocking up blood supply, and you can actually significant, you can kill a lot of these tumors. So we have a, you can see here, there are a lot of tools in our toolbox to use, right? One thing that's, so, so there are a lot of things that, that are very conventional. So let me tell you about Vanderbilt a little bit. So when I was uh, first recruited, so I, I did live in New York City, which is how I know Dr. Roz and, and the Cornell Center, but, um, and I was recruited down to Vanderbilt because they wanted to build a neuroendocrine center, okay? And I said, you know, I, I know what neuro means, and I know what endocrine means, but I don't know what neuroendocrine means, right? Pretty much no one knew what it was. So he said, don't worry about that, my chairman. He said, don't worry. I said, really? You're going to hire me? I have no idea what you want me to do, and you're going to hire me to do this, right? And he said, don't worry. I said, okay. And I trust him. He's, he's a brilliant, brilliant man. And so he said, I will send you to the most, because no one knows about it. See, that's the thing. He knew. No one knew about it. So he said, don't worry, we'll get trained up. So he sends me to Sweden, packs up me and my, young, my two young children and my wife. He said, go. So he sends me to Sweden, and he says, I want you to do this for me. This is the survival of the United States. This is the survival in Sweden. Okay, I want you to bridge this gap. That's what he wanted. I said, okay. No problem. No problem. <laughs> So, so I did. So we went to Sweden, and these are the things I did. The, the day I, well, after watching Dr. Oz, um, that what I did <laughs> was I, I put together a team effort, right, because I can't do this by myself. Never, ever, ever can you do this by yourself. We got a tumor board together. In fact, we meet every Monday. Oh, no, it's every Monday. Take that month off at noon. We developed a new technology in the United States. 
we develop new imaging agents, and we're doing new tumor profiles. So we're doing a bunch of really interesting things. Okay. So, so for those of you who don't know where Uppsala is, Uppsala, Sweden. Okay. He took me from Nashville, which is kind of the same area as, say, Monte Carlo. <laughs> and he sent me to Uppsala, Sweden, which is the same latitude as Uranium City in Canada. <laughs> I said, oh boy, <laughs> this better be worth it. And it was. It was really, really worth it. I mean, I had never been to Sweden before. You know, this is a kind of a new experience. And, and I said, well, let's try it. So here's, here's Europe. For, for those of you who don't know, you know, sometimes we don't always think about Europe. And here's Stockholm. Okay, so it's way, way north. And Uppsala is just outside of Stockholm. Kind of like um, Ann Arbor is to Detroit. Kind of thing like that. So it's the university. And it was great. It was really, really beautiful. We went in the fall. And the, it, it was just lovely. You know those old European cities? Just gorgeous, you know, old castles. So there's an old castle in the background. There's beautiful fountains. And they had the oldest church in um, Scandinavia and the oldest university in Scandinavia. So it was just lovely to see these things. And here's my son. He was only two at the time. And he was running around. Here's my little baby boy, who's now four. And he was only, um, I guess, maybe about five months when we, when we took him in that long airplane ride. And they had a beautiful botanical garden. So it was really a lovely experience. So it was great. And I would never have ever thought I'd do something like that. You know, sometimes you just have to take risks in life, right? And this one paid off. So here's the university. Here's, here's some more pictures. Oh, they bike a lot. OK, you know, Carl Dean's trying to get us all bike because we're all too fat, you know. But they actually do it. And this is, they actually do it very efficiently. So these are wide, you know, not like our bike lanes that are this wide, right? <laughs> These are real wide bike lanes, and you can see here, people use it as, as a means of transportation, truly as a means of transportation. So when you go, you know, there's a picture here. I must have dropped off. But there's a picture of the train station, and there's no parking. You, can, you can't park your car. But if you look at the bicycles, there are like 3,000 bicycles at the train station. Yeah, it's, it's really neat. So, so here's, oops, oops, here's the hospital that I worked at. So you know, you know, we don't know much about European hospitals, but you know what? They're just as good and just as advanced as ours. Okay? Here's the helipad, right? just like the one at Vanderbilt, just like the one at Vanderbilt. And this is what we did. So I finished my training in Sweden in 2009. We formed our things, and you know, we started doing stuff right away because I saw that there was such a discrepancy in the things that we could do here in the United States versus what is being done in Europe. I just had to catch up. It was just about like catching up. And so when we first, you know, before I arrived, you know, obviously most of the patients we saw were from the local area, kind of the local area. They, they just come to Vanderbilt for the name, as they do for the Mayo Clinic or the Cleveland Clinic or MD Anderson. But after we um, have been doing this for several years now, you can see this is actually where all our patients come from, right? It's actually relatively unusual for me to see a patient from Nashville because a lot of them do go to Centennial. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Sure. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Um, my husband had cancer of the pancreas, and it was on the head of the pancreas. Yeah. And that's why they were able to operate. But that, I was told at that time, and he had turned jaundice, mm -hmm. you know, and he had the pains in the stomach, mm -hmm. and everything was coming up. So because he was jaundiced, I knew it had affected his liver. Yes. And that is a very correct statement. So, so we love to think of the fact that people go into remission, right? And that's kind of a term that we've, we've adopted for leukemias and things like that. The problem is when a cancer is not happy and is angry, it usually sits elsewhere and you don't know about it. So cancer is much more a systemic disease than we like to think, which is why we do hit people very hard with chemo. So her husband you know, had, had probably and we'll speak in generics now, okay, so there's nothing. So, so probably had something called pancreatic adenocarcinoma, right, which is kind of the usual pancreas cancer, which is pretty deadly. It is pretty deadly. And the one thing that Steve Jobs wanted to do is he did not want people to think that he had pancreatic cancer. Okay, that was the thing he didn't want them to, to know. Because that is a, that is a you know, um, um, let's see here. Luciano Pavarotti had it. Um, um, the guy, Patrick Swayze had it. Um, 
Michael Landon, right, Michael Landon had it. So, and you know, they're, and they're not with us anymore, right? So it just goes to show you that it's, it's a different disease. So, but that particular cancer, so it's not necessarily that it affected his liver, but what it did, it was it blocked the tubes that drain the liver, okay? So this, and, and um, so they, you know, you can have surgery, you can remove it, kind of relieve those problems or other techniques, but you just get chemo because you just expect there to be tiny little specks and it'll come back in two, three, four years, right? Our disease is very similar, except that if you, get, if you treat it right, you can get them to live 10, 15, 20 years, right? So that's really the difference. So yes, the answer is there is a very fair chance it could have been in the liver. Yeah, well, they told me that. Yeah. I knew he was going to die. Right. I didn't know when, but I knew. Right. Yes, yes. And they did that, telling me that it would just give him some quality, but it would not, uh, would not uh, cure him. Cancer. Right, and that's the problem. That's the problem. And that's the problem with our cancers right now. We like to pat ourselves on the back and think that we're curing these people of their disease, when in fact we are not. Um, and we try our best. There's no question. I mean, every doctor, I don't question anyone's passion or desire or, or intentions. It's just that we ha it, is, it is far more complicated than um, we think it is. And that's, that's where it becomes quite a challenge, right? And this is just an example where if you just don't understand this particular disease pattern, you can treat it in the wrong, in the wrong pattern. But yeah, so thank you for sharing your story. So anyway, so we do see a lot of patients from all over the country, and it's very helpful. And really what we've become, we've become a, a referral center for referral centers, okay? So here's a lady who had her scan, and you can see this is, you don't have to be a radiologist. This is not very fancy. There's nothing there. But then she came to our center and she had this. And so she actually had a bunch of tumors, sorry, a bunch of tumors inside here. And that's, she was the very first person to ever have this test. So we take this molecule, we, we put a little uh, um, isotope inside here, and it's like a light bulb. Okay, so we take very, very fancy pictures at Vanderbilt. That's essentially what it is. And so we, uh, it's the next generation. Remember that fuzzy scan I showed you, which was just not very satisfying? So we, that's, we have the next generation. So we have the 21st century version of that at Vanderbilt. And we were the only center, we were the very, very first in the United States to do it. Since then, you know, it's kind of like having fire or a screwdriver or a hammer. You know, it, you just can't hold on to that. You know, you have to share it. So we, we share this with many centers around the country and we hope this will be something that all patients will have access to. Here it is, it's a, it looks like a coffee maker, right? So this side, this side produces gallium. This size produces mocha. So, <laughs> so you do have to be an expert. And you have to read the instructions. You have to read the instructions. So now, so here, for example, is a lady, and she lives here in Nashville, and, and I can share a story because she's really good about it. She went over to the hospital across the street, which is a fine hospital, don't get me wrong. There are wonderful, wonderful doctors there. I would go there if I was sick, no problem. She had a disease, she had a tumor, it was removed, and she was told that she was NED, no evidence of disease. She was told she was cured. Okay. So then she says, she goes about her merry way, and she says, and then the, she's sitting with her husband, and she's watching TV, and Steve Jobs just died. Right? And her husband is, he's a big, strong guy, and he is crying and crying and crying, and she's tortured. And so she gets up from the TV, sits down at, at the computer, and she looks up neuroendocrine, right? And she, said, she did it apparently the week before, and then she looked it up that day, and then she found me. So she said, well, I'm gonna go come see Dr. Liu. So she comes to see me, and I say, okay, well, let me, it, it, you're probably not cured, but let's just work you up a little bit more. So I get that fancy scan, th this semi-fancy scan called the MRI, and I'm sorry it blinks, but you can see there are some funny things inside here, but it looks mostly okay, it looks mostly okay. Except for this, oh, I'm sorry, well, you get the idea. Anyway, it, except for this tiny little speck on the skin, and those, most people wouldn't have even noticed this, but there was a tiny little speck right there. And I said, hmm, that didn't smell right. So I get her this fancy dancy skin that we have. She's like the 15th person to have it. And she had this. She had a tumor right there, right? And, and I don't blame anyone. That's very hard to find. You know why? Because it sits underneath the heart, and the heart moves. And these pictures are not good at taking move, moving objects. This one is. 
So they found it, and we, and, and we watched it for a little bit just to see how it behaves, and then we, I took her to the opera and we mm -hmm. removed it. Okay, and she's doing very, 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 very well. In fact, she's now, you know, just, she, she's doing what we all want to do. She has a good quality of life, good quality of life. So this is something called a gallium-68 dotatate PET scan. We, are the only, we were the only university in the United States to do this. And what it is, it's that it's basically, just imagine. So if you can think of the Actria scan as, being, as looking at a flashlight, this is like having a laser beam come at you, right? It's just very fine and focused and sensitive. So it has what we call a higher sensitivity and a higher resolution. Okay? So here's another one. So she had three tumors on conventional imaging. And she was sent to me by my friend in New York City at Mount Sinai. She said, I can't figure out what's going on. Will you do this for her? I said, sure, no problem. And you can see why it was a problem, because she had had like four surgeries previously. So they couldn't figure out what was going on, and I can't get it to advance. I'm sorry, I must be too far away. Yeah. So in fact, she had, they thought she had three. She had one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. She had nine. And so I sent her back to my friend, and he, she, he undergoes surgery, and she says, Eric, I can, he calls me in the operating room, I can only find eight. There are only eight. I say, no, Sasan, <laughs> there are nine. And he says, I can't find it. I say, okay, well, look, do what you do have to do. So he closes her up. Three months later, he rescans her. What does he find? The ninth one, right. He finds the ninth one, right. So that just goes to show you. So, but here's why it's a problem, because you can look at, this is her MRI scan, which is correct, right? So they're a good center. But you see all those, like, weird patches and gunk and that big divot right here, you see that? Those are all surgical scars. So you can't really figure out what's going on. So I looked at this, for example. Right? I looked at this, and I said, oh, that must be from his operation. Then I did her gallium scan, and it turned out to be a big fat hunk of tumor. All right? So it just goes to show you that even someone who, who does this a lot, depending on the technology, you can only get so much information. Yes, ma'am. I'm sorry, I'm running late, so I, I can move faster if you'd like, but go ahead. Uh, a doctor finds a tumor, let's say, in the liver. Yeah. So it's complicated. The most common way you do it is you put a needle into it. And you suck out a few cells from it. And I know people think, oh, well, you're going to make the tumor spread. No, that's not the case. That is not the case. When you put needles in things, you get the information from it. And if it's spread, it's going to spread. It's not the needle's fault. So you put a needle into it. You put it under the microscope, and you look very carefully. And you have a very good pathologist. They can say, this is a, this cancer, or this is a, that cancer. So that's what we call a biopsy. That's what we call a biopsy. So that's the, usually the way we do it. But anyway, so that's kind of what we do. Well, I hate to say, but time is indeed uh, up. We thank I'm you sorry. So very, very much.